All right, I got two more examples of how to do these Venn diagrams. Then I'm going to show you one where it does commit the existential fallacy from the modern or Boolean perspective. And you'll actually learn a little bit more about this distinction that I keep bringing up here and there, um, which you'll find interesting and helpful. OK, let's go to this next um, um, example here. All right, let's do all S R M. So we just look at the S and the M circle. and. Um, <coughs> So we will do this, right? This region is empty. All S or M. And let's do the other one. All M or P. Look at the M and the P. So this is every single M is going to be overlapping in the P region. So we would do this. OK. And then this says all S R P, right? Um, so what this means is with the S and the P region, uh, if every S is a P, that means the region of the S circle to the far left, you know, this, this right here. See all that? That is going to be completely shaded. So um, let's see what we come up with here. Let me go back there. So I know I keep referring, but I just want you to just kind of get this. So what this means here is this region, if we're looking at the S and the P only, all S or P, if you didn't have that M circle, you'd want to see if this whole area is shaded. And lo and behold, it is. It's shaded here from one premise. It's shaded here from the other. But all I can see is the region we need shaded is shaded. So I will call that valid. OK. <clears throat> Let's go to one more. And here we have particulars, OK? So this will give us some practice on, you know, putting the x on the line. All right, first one. Some m are not p. So we look at the m and the p. There's at least one m, right? There's at least one m that isn't a p. So here's p, p, you know, we're walking, and we're walking, and we're walking. And right there, there's at least one m that's not a p. So it's in this region, but it's going to be on the line, right? It's past that line, so it's not a p. But it's going to be on the line because it doesn't say there's at least one m that's not a p and not an s. If it, we knew it was not an s, we'd put it here. And it doesn't say there's at least one M that's not a P, but is an S, or we'd put it here. So when you have it on the line, that means question mark in terms of what direction it goes. All you know, it's not a P. All right? And then we have some S, R, M. So we just look at the um, S and M circle. And it says there's at least one S that is an M. It means it's in the overlap region. But either it's bisected, both sides are empty, so we will go ahead and put an X there. Because really what it's, it's not, it's only saying there is at least one S that is an M. But if we put it here, it's saying more than what this is saying. If we put it here, it'd be there's at least one S that is an M and not a P if we put it here. We don't know if it's not a P. If we put the x down here in this little region here, we'd be saying there's at least one s that is an m, and it is a p. And we certainly don't want to do that. OK, so we've got the x's in the right place. Now, do we have drawn already from what we've done up here? Let's see, some s are not p. We should have at least one x that's outside the p circle. So, so we're looking at S and P. Here's the P circle. We need to have, for certain, an X here. And we don't. We don't know it's over here. We don't know this is over here. This could be there. That could be there. So we're going to have to say that that is, oops, um, invalid. OK. Now, let's go to uh, another example here. Let's go down, OK? All right. Now, here's where we're going to deal with the existential fallacy and bring in Aristotle. Everything I've given to you 
was these pure logical relationships and Aristotle won't have a problem. If something's valid or invalid from all the examples I've done so far, the Boolean or modern people, the Boolean or modern standpoint, Aristotle people, Aristotelian standpoint, no problem. Okay, you don't have to worry about that. If the Venn diagram, the conclusion, categorical proposition diagram has already been drawn in, it's valid from Aristotle or uh, um, the Boolean, okay? But when you get to something like this, um, here is when pos we could be committing the uh, existential fallacy. The, the modern will say it is being committed, and the Aristotelian will say, hold on, just wait a minute. It, it all depends. It's valid if a condition is meant that's important to me, Aristotle, that a key term is referring to something that exists. Okay, so let's first go ahead and draw this. Remember, um, <clears throat> you remember your modern people said if you have a universal proposition, you don't know if anything exists. You remember, um, okay, let's change this here. Let's just do this down here real quick. You remember if you have a universal proposition, and this is, let's say it's all S. RP. Remember, if you're a Martian, all you know, if every S is a P, <coughs> you don't know if S exists. They say all you know is that you're not going to have any S's that aren't P's if you've already said every single S is going to be a P. <coughs> so logic says you only know that. And notice <coughs> with this universal proposition, no X has been drawn, right? So if there's no X can be drawn from universal categorical propositions, you're not going to see it. So we need to see an X drawn from with this conclusion. You're not going to see it. So let's go ahead and draw this. <coughs> All M R S. So just think of the M and S circle. Go ahead and draw this in, right? Okay, and then this says all, um, so all, let's see, I'm so, wait a minute, let's uh, start over on that. I think I drew that wrong there. Okay. Okay, here we go. All, let's start with the first one. All M R P, and we've got to get that M back up there. Okay, every single M is a P. We want to do this, right? Okay, all M are P, then we're going to draw all S are M. So we're going to be doing this, right? That is all drawn in there. And then what is our, so these are two universal propositions, and if we just draw the logical relationships, this is what we get. And then our conclusion says, if this is a valid syllogism, we should see at least one S that's in the P region. We should see an X. So here is the P region, right? We should see in the overlap region between S and P, which is right here, see that? <coughs> we should see an X. And we don't see an X. So from the Boolean, modern standpoint standpoint this is going to be invalid okay invalid so this is why from that standpoint they don't want to think about existence there I'm a Martian and I don't know anything about anything on earth I don't know if S and P refer or the middle term. All I know is logic just tells me these regions will always be empty. Okay? <clears throat> so you never draw an X. So you're not going to see an X invalid. Okay. But what is Aristotle going to say? <clears throat> Remember Aristotle, and let's extend this page here. Aristotle says, you know, if you're talking about things on earth like all horses, are four-legged animals, right? Then he says, you mean to tell me when you say all horses are four-legged animals, then you know 
<coughs> that there that um, some horses are four-legged animals. Um, well, that's true too. All horses are four-legged animals. Then you're gonna have an X here. Then we know at least one horse is a four-legged animal. And the reason is, he says, we do know something about this. If we say all horses are four-legged animals, we know horses exist. We know you're never going to have a horse over here that isn't a four-legged animal, but we already know. And so Aristotle says, circle the X. The X means because we know these terms refer, we know there's existence. So he's going to say, if you have a universal proposition about things that exist, we know that a particular thing exists, and he says you can draw an X. Even in the universal proposition, he says just circle it. But you Martians, you didn't want to put anything in here? You know, I totally disagree with you. I'm from Earth, and I know. Okay, so let's go back up to this. So how's, what's Aristotle going to do? <coughs> He's going to say... I know you modern people are looking at this and you're seeing universal propositions and you say they don't have existential import so you never can affirm the instantiation of one X. He says, I disagree with you if one condition is met, but if that condition is not met, I will agree with you and call this an existential fallacy because when they said it was um, invalid, the bullion, they will say it is committing the existential fallacy. I forgot to write that a few minutes before here. But Aristotle said it won't be committing the existential fallacy if the key term refers to something in the world or exists. If it doesn't, he's going to say, okay, with you modern people here, I agree, and it also does. So here's what you do. <coughs> when you know you have universal premises and they're concluding a particular conclusion. You remember that's rule five? From the Boolean it's always going to be invalid, but here's what Aristotle says to do. <coughs> he says, look, find the circle where everything is shaded in except for one region. So when you look at all these circles, which is the circle where you have three regions shaded in but not a fourth? It's not this one, the M circle, because you have two regions still not shaded in, and they're not going to be. If you look at the P circle, you've got three not shaded in. Uh, what you do is find the circle where three regions, or all of it, is shaded in except one section, right? And that would be the S circle. And normally, you're going to get a proposition that started out with English propositions and you converted it into the skeleton. Now, I know where this came from. This came from section 5.3 when they were just starting to talk about the Aristotelian standpoint. S refers to tigers. So what you do is, this is going to be, this kind of skeleton is always going to be invalid from the modern. Invalid, it commits the existential fallacy. Aristotle says, hold on, this won't commit the existential fallacy for me if a condition is met. So he says, here's what I want you all to do. <clears throat> so he's talking to you students. Find the circle where every region is filled in, shaded, except for one. Has something going on in each section except for one. Here it's going to be shaded. And the only one that does it is the S circle. He says, go back to the syllogism with the English terms find the minor term, is it talking about a real world entity, uh, uh, an entity that refers to something in the world, and take my word for it, S for this was tigers. So tigers really exist, um, you can put that in there, and therefore we have an X now in the Venn diagram, so this, so what this is saying is, you should at least see an S that's in the P region. Here's S, here's P, here's the overlap, and lo and behold, we do see it. So Aristotle's going to say this. From the Aristotelian standpoint, this would be valid. However, let's say S refer to trolls or, or T-Rexes. If they don't exist, Aristotle will not put an X in here, right? 
He won't put an X in there. And then he will agree and he would say, um, then he'd say not valid and he would agree existential fallacy. Okay, you got to understand if there's something in that a area that doesn't refer, Aristotle does use the term existential fallacy, but only if his condition isn't met. So if you weren't able to put an X in there and circle it because it referred to trolls, right? Then he'd say invalid and with the modern people they'd be hand in hand <coughs> and say yes we agree an existential fallacy is being committed. But if it isn't trolls and it's tigers he's gonna go, you know, he's gonna say valid put that back in there, circle it and he'll say valid. Okay, so that's how you do um, Venn diagrams for syllogisms. We, we've talked about the um, Aristotelian standpoint, how it comes into play. Remember, if you never see two universals concluding a particular categorical proposition, then you don't have to worry about Aristotle bullion, okay? Uh, everything up to here, just do it. Don't even talk about modern and Aristotelian. If you see the conclusion drawn in, just say valid. But when you know it's it's two universal premises arguing for a particular conclusion. Then Aristotle's going to quickly come in the room. He's going to sit down with the modern person and they've got a few things to hash out. Okay, and remember when you have a syllogism, I've given you your three methods now. Let's go down here. If you have a syllogism to find out if it's valid or invalid, you know, valid or or invalid there's three methods mood and figure list and remember there's two of them the modern and then the the Aristotelian provided that conditions met there's the first one the second one was syllogistic rules and if those rules are violated they have names for those violations they call them fallacies and then the third one right now is then diagrams for syllogisms and here's the thing that should make sense if a syllogism is valid mood and figure, you should see the mood and figure on one of those two lists, right? If it's valid, it shouldn't break any of those five rules, right? <coughs> and um, if it's valid, you should be able to have valid Venn diagrams, okay? So there should be consistency here as long as you make sure you're consistent with the Boolean and the Aristotelian where those distinctions uh, come into play. Now, don't forget um, I'm going to give all of you a Venn diagram for syllogisms extra credit um, test. It's going to be worth at least 24 points nothing to snub at and I will let you know through a D2L email when we're going to do that but you're not going to have to worry about it for set number three and test number three we're going to do it later and what it will involve is I'm going to give you a syllogism in English sentences in English propositions, obviously be English, you are going to have to, and let me extend this page, the second thing you'll do with that is put it into a skeleton. Okay, and that means you're going to use S, P, and M, middle, minor, um, you know, middle term, major term, minor term, and then three, uh, you're, 
going to um, uh, draw a Venn diagram for it. And then the fourth step in all this is you're going to tell me something. You're going to read the Venn diagram and you're going to tell me some things about it. Okay, so there's four steps. You're given a proposition, a syllogistic argument in English with English, in English propositions. You're going to then convert that into a skeleton. You're going to then draw that skeleton into a Venn diagram and then you're going to have to uh, read it. Okay? And so through D2L I will notify you when we will be doing that, but for set number three and test number three, you do not have to worry about those Venn diagrams for syllogisms right now. I'll give you a week just to focus on that, but the good news is here it's going to be for extra credit, okay? All right, I hope this was uh, helpful. You can uh, stop, rewind as much as you want until you get how to do these graphs. You get it locked down, okay?